So what we want to start today is to move to our next logic. So propositional logic was mainly there to demonstrate what is being done in logic. And we want to move to a more useful logic that is much more expressible. So in what way is a propositional logic not expressible enough? So look, for example, at the first example that we saw of a logical argument and see does propositional logic really capture what is happening there? So the first example that we looked at was this example of uh, every man is mortal. Uh, Socrates is a man. And therefore, we conclude from these two that Socrates is mortal. Right, so we have these two assumptions and we reach this conclusion. And we said that the goal of logic or one way of viewing the goal of logic is that logic is a way to tell us how to get from assumptions to conclusions, right? And this was our first example Okay, so we said that the goal of logic is to help us uh, figure out how to get from assumptions to conclusions. Here is our first example. We have one logic, propositional calculus. What can propositional calculus tell us about this? So propositional calculus, we have those P's and Q's which stand for statements that could be either true or false. So here, here is one statement. Every man is mortal. So I can say, OK, here is a statement. All I can do is call it P. And here is another statement. It's not the same statement, so I cannot use P for it. So I can call it Q. Here is a statement which is yet a new one. It's not any of these that we saw before. So I don't know what. Let's call it uh, S. So if we try to uh, translate it to propositional logic, we say we get that P and Q implies S. And we have no reason to see why this P and Q implies this S. There's nothing that propositional logic can tell us about why this is valid. Because propositional logic doesn't look into the inside of a statement. It just takes a statement and views only one aspect of it. Is it true or is it false? But it doesn't look at how is the statement, right? So we, we sure we can break. If I have a statement that's saying, you know, uh, if, then, and so on, I can break it into substatements as long as I can connect them with my propositional logic connectives. But I cannot break down any, this is kind of an atomic statement. I cannot break it down any further with propositional logic. And therefore, propositional logic doesn't give me any hint why this should be correct, why this should be more correct than any other P, Q, and S with such an implication. So we clearly need a more expressive logic, a logic that could somehow reflect not only the question of whether a statement is true or false, but also model something about the structure of the statement. And that's what first order logic is coming to do. And the, the term first order logic is a bit confusing. We will be able to explain it only later. So we, we start with a name that we have no reason, no intuition why we, this name is being used. Uh, so, sometimes it's called predicate calculus, which make more sense. So we'll call it first order logic or predicate calculus. And the idea with predicate calculus is that Somehow, when we make statements, especially when we make statements in mathematics, we can break a statement 
into two components. So we break, it breaks statements into two components. One component uh, is objects, and the other component is properties. So uh, this logic will somehow go down into the structure of the sentence and talk about objects and their properties. And here it is very clear, because the, the first sentence it has an object man, and it has the property mortal, and we have the object Socrates, and so on. So if we start breaking our statements into objects and their properties, then we can get more insight into why things may be true. Okay? Now, when I say properties, here the property is just a property of a single person, but the properties, we, this is what we call predicates here, they could be not just properties of a single object, but they could be properties of a group of objects. So it could be a Johnny, John likes Mary. So this is, uh, I have here two objects. This is an object, this is an object. This is a property, but this is a property that connects two objects. It's not a property of Johnny that he likes, right? So the properties could be either a unary, they talk about a property of a single object, or they could be properties that connect few uh, objects, and then we call them predicates. So this is why it is called predicate calculus. So th this is the next step we are going to take. We're going to develop a logic that can break statements into the properties and objects. And this logic will be expressive enough that it will be able to tell us not only why this is true, but it will actually strong enough to discuss any statement in mathematics. And we'll see that this logic is also expressive enough to reason about most things we care about in, in programs. So let me start, before I start with a formal definition of this uh, logic, I want to start with uh, some kind of a intuitive uh, high level examples of what we will be able to express. So the first thing to note is that, the, or the second thing, after we, we claim that this is a logic that's going to distinguish objects from properties, is that actually first order logic or predicate calculus is a big family of logics. So the, this is a, actually, we shall discuss a large family of languages. Now, there are things that all of those languages are going to have in common, and there are things which are going to be particular to each language, depending on what we want to, this language to uh, address. So, what is common to all of them, so we are going to have common to all of them, common to all, we are going to have what we call logical symbols. And our logical symbols are going to have to be, first of all, the connectives that we already know. Secondly, we are going to have, so these are the propositional connectives. The second type of uh, logical symbols are going to be for all and there exist, which are called quantifiers. So they say something, they quantify. This holds for all, 
this, there exists at least one for which it holds. One could think of other quantifiers as well, like there exists exactly two, or for all but finitely many, but here we will just have those two quantifiers that just tell me how often do my properties uh, hold. So these are my logical uh, symbols. The other thing that is common to all of the logics that we will discuss is the notion of equality. So we can, uh, there are also logics that don't use it, but we will in the class always talk about equality. So with equality, what I mean is that I want a way of saying that two objects are the same object, that two names refer to the same object. I want to be able that, to say that, you know, my, if I say my, uh, oldest daughter and I say the O, which is her name, I want to be able to say those two refer to the same object. So I want to have to carry around with me the equality to talk about equality and we will see why it plays a special role. So we have logical uh, symbols, we have equality, and then we have language specific symbols. As I told you, this is going to be a family of languages, and every language will have symbols that will come to uh, allow us to address what is needed for this language. And, and those are going to be uh, of three types, constants, constant symbols, or let's call them yeah, constant symbols, relation symbols, and function symbols. And those we are going to add or take out according to the language that we are talking about. So maybe the best way, thing to do now is give you some examples of specific languages and what are those symbols that are special to the language that you are going to use. So let us say I want to talk, I think the natural, the most natural uh, application or example of a logic within this uh, framework of predicate calculus is a language to talk about uh, numbers. So say we want, I want a language, so now I'm taking a specific language. So I'm going to examples informal examples of specific languages. So if I want a language to talk about number theory, a language for number theory. So here I will take as constant symbols, for constant symbols, I may take say zero and one because they are special numbers. They have special roles in number theory. And as function symbols, I may want to have plus and times. And as uh, relation symbols, I want to have, say, less or equal than. But I will not use the symbols of number theory. I mean, my language usually will just use the same symbols 
for regardless of what is the intended interpretation. So let's call my constant symbols, let's call them A, A and B, and let's call my functions F and G, and my relation R. But when we talk about number theory, we know that A is intended to be zero and so on. So what can I say now with this? So here are my logical symbols. Now I have these special symbols for number theory. Now I can say things like, uh, so let, let me say, so I want to say something like x, let me write a statement and you will tell me what it is, okay? What, what did I want to say in English? So I want to say something about, uh, I have a formula here, phi, that talk about x, and this formula tells me the following, for every y and every z, if g of y, z equals x, then y equals x or z equals x. So what is the property of x that I'm describing here? So now we call g stands for times and this stands for for all, for all, <coughs> equality, and the error is my us our usual uh, error symbol from predicate calculus. So what does it say? What is the property of x that I'm describing here? Yes? That for every combination of the two constants of 0 and 1, uh, if they multiply... There's no, there's no constants here. My constants are a and b, and I don't see here a and b. Isn't that what the four laws imply? Or? No, okay, so the... Uh, there is also a notion of what is the domain that I'm okay, talking so about. And I'm talking about the domain of all natural numbers. So for all natural numbers, if they multiply to a number, one or the other is that number? Right, so what does it tell me about x? It's a prime number. It's a prime number. This is just a way of saying x is a prime number, right? Can you try to say x is even. That'll be harder. So try to say x is an even number. That's harder, so you want to try? Yes. Uh, Right, so I can say psi of x will be there exists a z such that f of z, z equals x. So you see I'm using the equality freely and I, I have my interpretation that says this is addition. So this is saying x is an even number. And I could also say differently. I mean, assume that I didn't have, assume that I, had, I am, have a crippled language and I don't have f. Can I say that x is, an, you have a question here? No, I can't. How can I say that x is an even number if I don't have f in my language? In a, in a more limited language where I don't have a symbol for a, a addition, yes? There exists a z such that g of z and 2. And, and where do I get 2 from? 1 plus 1. It's one part of your domain. 1 plus 1. Yeah, but then I don't have plus. Can't use specifics of your domain? No, I cannot. So, you see, all I have is this language. All I have is just those symbols. So maybe it's going to be difficult. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can't even get two because you can't add one and one. No, you cannot. I mean, you all can only use the symbols of your language. Okay? So the, anyway, these are just informal statements. Let's look at a different example. So I can say all kinds of things about natural numbers, and I can even phrase 
Uh, okay, let, let me just give you one more example. Can anybody tell me this, say the statement, there exist infinitely many prime numbers? How can I say with this language that I have here, I want to say there exist, there are infinitely many prime numbers. Yes. Right, I don't even need the x, right, so I can just say for every x there exists y such that uh, r x y and phi of y. r x y tells me x is less or equal than y. And phi of y tells me y is a prime. Well, phi is, I can substitute this. So this is my phi. Well, see, if I say for every x there is a y above it that is a prime, then it's equivalent to saying there are infinitely many primes. So this language for number theory, all I need is this collection of specific symbols, and I can say quite a lot of things. So now let us look at another example. So let us look at an, another example. And my second example is a language for set theory. So this is a very basic uh, language in mathematics, a language for set theory. So what is set theory? Set theory, I just talk about sets, and I talk about which sets are subsets of others, and which elements belong to which set. So it turns out that for a language of set theory, I need very little. All I need is just one relation symbol. So I have one relation symbol, one relation relation symbol that will stand for member of. So that will be R and so Rxy, Rxy will stand for X is a member of Y because I'm talking about sets. Everything is sets. I can say one set is a member of another set. So can you tell me, I want now to have phi of x that will say x is the empty n, empty set. Can you have a way of saying it? x is an empty set. Yes. For all y, the empty set is not an element of every other set. It's a subset, but they don't have subset. Yes, what do you? There exists no y such that. Right. So I can say there exists no y. So for all y, it is not the case that our y x. So that's the property of x. For every y, y is not a member of x. And how can I say there is only one empty set? Yes. Right. I'll say if phi of x for every x, for every y, phi of x 
and phi of y arrows x equals y. If x is empty and y is empty, then they must be the same element. So you see, we are using the equality strongly. How can I say, for example, that x, I want now a property, I want the psi of x and y that will say x is a subset of y. How can I say that? Yes? For all what? For all elements. Uh, you have to give me a formula. Okay. For all z, so then what? Well, what? How do I say elements? Can you use? Yeah, I can, you can use whatever you want. I'm not saying it's impossible. Yes. R of Z X implies, implies R, of Z. R of Z Y. Right. R of Z for all Z, if Z is a member of X and Z is a member of Y. Okay? And now you, it's not difficult to see that I can say Z is the union of X and Y. I will say for every, for every element T, if t is in z, then t is in x, or t is in y, or intersection, or whatever I want to say about sets. OK, we are still in the informal part of it. Let me just give you one more example of what can we say informally. But now, instead of, talking of, of, of taking a domain and say, what should be my logic to discuss this domain, let me Look at an example and ask, what can we express if I don't have any? I only have, I, I think, what can I express? What can we say in the minimal language? What do I mean by minimal language? We said that every language can have its own special symbols, language-specific symbols. What if I don't have any language-specific symbols? So I don't have any constants. I don't have any function symbols. I don't have any relation symbols. What can I say? That's a good question. Am I back to propositional logic, or I can say something more than that? Yes? You can still use for all and there exist. I can still use for all and there exist and equal. So what can I say with it? So let's see how can we say with the empty language. So now I have no constant symbols. No function symbols. No relation symbols. <coughs> and I claim that I can still say some things. Yes? Um, something you couldn't do in propositional logic is things that previously would have been infinitely long propositions in propositional logic. So all propositional variables are the same um, for all x, for all y, x equals y. Right, so it's not propositional variables. It's not posi right. so. But I can say, I can talk about my universe. I can say, I have in my universe only one element. So these statements say, for every x, for every y, x equals y, which is the same as saying there is only one element in my universe.
How can I say, can you have a way of saying there are exactly two elements in my universe? Or let's say, let's say something like this. There, I want to say there are more or okay, let, more or less more than two elements. How can I say this? Any new voice? Yes. Right. There exists x, there exists y, there exists z, such that not x equals y and not y equals z and not x equals z. There exist three elements such that no two of them are the same, which means I have, at least I have more than two elements. How can I say there are at most two elements? Yes. Or y equals z. Right. So I want to say that for every, whenever you try to get me three guys, for every x, for every y, for every z, two of them must be the same because they are only, uh, I don't have three in my. So either x equals y, or y equals z, or x equals z. So even the empty language can express things. It mainly can talk about how many elements I have in my universe. But once we add symbols, we can do a lot of things. OK, so, so this is going to be a big family of languages. And uh, each language will have its own symbols. And we will go into talk about what's common to all of those languages. OK? Now we are, that we know where we are heading, what in kind of roughly we want to say, we can start the process exactly following the steps that we did in propositional logic. So what we are going to have to do is we are going to have syntax, semantics, and we are going to start by defining what is a well-defined formula in our language. And then we are going to have some proof system. And we are going to have the notion of uh, consistency and uh, sigma proofs alpha. And everything, all the kind of things that we saw. We are going to repeat the same and same here. We're going to have about, we're going to talk about logical implications and uh, sigma is satisfiable and so on. So we're going to actually repeat everything that we did before with the difference that our language is more complicated and therefore things will be more technical. So that was my main motivation in doing everything first in propositional calculus, that you'll get used to the ideas and the way of thinking before we have to be bothered with technical, idea, with technical details. Now we have to be a bit more careful about technical details, and let us start here. What is a well-found formula? So now we are given a language. We fix the language. So we fix the language and describe the language. So we fix fix a language what does it mean to fix a language so we fix a set of uh, constant symbols
So let's say my constant symbols are going to be a1, a2, and so on. And I fix some uh, function symbols. And they are, are going to be, say, f1, f2, and so on. But with which each of them I have to tell you, we also have to tell you what is the arity of those functions. So with each of them, I have to tell you what is the arity. So this could be 1, 1, 3, 2, and so on. What do I mean by arity? Is it a, a function of one variable, or is it a function of three variables, or is it a function of two variables? So when we fix, we fix our function symbols, we have to declare for each of them how many variables it addresses. So this could be like things like addition is a two variable function, a square is a one variable function, okay? And similarly, we are going to have our relation symbols And we are going to have here R1, R2, R3, and so on. And again, each of them will have its arity. It could be 1, 1, 2, whatever. The arity of a relation symbol, it could be, is it a relation that talks about one element, Socrates is mortal, or it's a relation that talks about two elements, John likes Mary, and so on. So this is our language. On top of it, we have the uh, logical uh, symbols that we talked about. Logical symbols are what we knew from propositional logic plus the two quantifiers. So this is, these are our characters of our language. And now we want to define the set of all WAFs, the set of all legal formulas. Now it turns out that here, before I can define the set of all legal formulas, I have to be even take things more slowly. So the first thing I'm going to define is the th set of all objects that are going to denote, oh, the set of all sequences that are going to denote object. So our step zero, before we can define even our first step, step one is we define the collection of uh, words, well, with words I mean sequences of characters that denote objects. You remember we said that this language distinguishes objects from properties, and the things that denote objects are going to, we are going to call them terms. And the set of all terms is all, this is not even, I'm not even talking about my language, because my language, see, my language could be saying x is an odd number, but x is a term. x talks about an object. So I, I'm going to have my objects. And I'm going to define the set of terms. These are the objects. The set of terms is already defined by inductive definition. So the set of terms, the set of terms is defined, the set of terms is defined as I A P. Well, A, my core set, is the set of all constant symbols. And all variable symbols, so We are going to have that assume that we have a sequence of variable symbols x1, x2, xn, and so on. So those are 
I think I missed it when I talked about the logical symbols. Those will be, those will be in every language. They are logical symbols and they are variables. We will need variables. So my atomic elements, the atomic things that denote objects, are either constants or variables. When I say x, I talk about an object. When I say a, I talk about a object. And we're going to have p. And what is p? The set p is going to be the set of all uh, operations. So the set p is going to be the set of all o of f, such that f is a, a function symbol. And what do I mean by O of f? It's an operation that takes t1, t2, and outputs f of t1, t2. This is the operation O of f for two place f. For a one place f, it takes t and outputs f of t. For a three uh, place f, it will take t1, t2, t3, and outputs. So my objects are either constant or variables and things that I apply functions to. So now that we have defined our A and P, the set of terms is well defined and we can look at some examples. But notice that we don't have any statement yet, nothing that can be true or false. It's just what shall we denote, what shall we use to denote objects? Well, there was a question here? OK, so let, let me just go. I mean, we know what is inductive definition is, but let us just uh, consider some examples to see what do I mean by terms. What can I get in this set? So let us go back to our examples that we had before. What will be the terms, examples of terms? So what will be our terms in the, the language for number theory? The first example of a language that we discussed. What kind of terms am I going to have there? So I'm going to have there, of course, A and B, because, and I'm going to have X1 and X2 and so on. All of those are atomic terms. But what else am I going to have here? A plus B. Yeah, but there was my F, right. So I'm going to have here F of AB, which was the plus. And I'm going to have G of X and A, and G of X, Y. And I'm going to have F of G of X, A, and say Y. And I can keep applying f and g to this. Because each of these is a term. Right? So terms, you can think of it, if I unfold it into the plus and, t and times, and a is 0 and b is 1, so I can, have, uh, I can translate what a term means. So say I have this term uh, g of f of a, a, x, right? So I had this atomic term. I had here two atomic terms, and I applied f, and then I applied g to this. In the language of number theory that we use, that we usually use, what is this standing for? a is 1. Oh, a was 0. Oh, sorry. So let's put it b. Let's put b here. That'll have some meaning to it. B is 1, F is plus, G is times. So what is this standing for? This just stands for 2x, right? Because this is 2, it's 1 plus 1, and this is x, and this is times, so this stands for 2x, right? So give me an expression that stands for x squared plus 3y. So
So what do I need to do here? I need to do write x squared. How will I write x squared? Gxx. Gxx. Now I want to do plus, then I'll have f. And now I want to say 3 times y. So it's going to be, right, I can do f of f, y, y, and y. Right? So f, y, y is y plus y. Plus y, I have here three y's. And then I do x times x is x squared, and the f is plus. So we see that in the language of number theory, it's not difficult to see that every term is actually a way to denote a polynomial. And I will not be able to express anything other than polynomials with my terms. So my terms are going to actually be a clumsy way of writing polynomials. These are going to be my terms in the language of number theory. Does it make sense? Right, if I write a term, you can translate it to a polynomial. I give you a polynomial, you can find a term that corresponds to it. But I still don't have any statement that I can say it's true or false. It's just the object that I'm going to talk about. These are the objects that I can talk about. OK, let us move to the next, our next example. So our next example was the language of set theory. What are going to be my uh, terms in the language of set theory? So example two, the terms of the language of set theory. So in the language of set theory, let me remind you, we didn't have any constants and we didn't have any function symbols. We only had one relation symbol. So now when I go to this definition, then what am I going to have in my set P of operations? Nothing, no operations. No operations, so I have IAP with no operations, so it's just A. So this is just going to be just the no function symbols. Therefore, the set of operations is empty. So IAP is just A. So it's just the only terms that I will have are the variables. I don't have any constant symbols. That's the variables. And what will be the terms in the empty language? What are going to be the terms? My third example, the terms in the empty language. It's going to be the same. Same. Just variables. Symbols. Okay. So, given a language, given a vocabulary, a set of specific symbols for the language, I can talk about the terms of this language. In the worst case, in the minimal case, the terms are just going to be the variable symbols. If I have functions, then I have more and more terms. Once I have functions, I already have infinitely many terms. Okay? Now we are moving to the next step. We want to use those terms to make WAFs, to make formulas that can mean something, that can be true or false. So step two is I want to define now the set of all formulas but I start with, I still ha I even have to work for the atomic formulas. So the, set, the second step, step two, is defining 
our WAFs, our formulas. And we'll do it again, again, as I A P. But we have to work even to define A. So step, step one and a half is defining the set of atomic formulas. My A. I want to define this guy. So the set of atomic formulas are going to be the set of all atomic formulas are the set of all R T1 up to Tk such that R is a K Ari relation symbol. And T1 up to Tk are terms. So we, only ha we already have the definition of terms, the object that we can talk about. And now we define atomic formulas, which is a relation applied to the terms. So what are some examples of atomic formulas? So examples, again, we can look at it in each of our languages. So in the first language of uh, the language of number theory, we can have things like what? Can you give me an example of uh, atomic formula in number theory? Yes. A is less than B, right. So R, A, B means it really stands for 0 is less so equal than 1. And this is going to be true. Can you give me an example of a more complex formula? I can say I can use any terms here. I have only one relation symbol, but I, I can only use R. But here I can have any two terms. So I can have R of f a x g of f b b y. Did I put enough? Uh, yeah. So what does this stand for? It just stands for saying f a x is x plus 0. And this is say is less or equal than FBB is 1 plus 1 is 2, less or equal than 2Y. So this is an atomic formula that says X is less than 2Y. Or X plus 0 is less than 2Y. So this is a term, T1. This is a term, T2. And I can state a relation statement over those terms, or a predicate over those terms. Okay? But now already they even the empty language can state interesting things. So what can I say in the in the language? So let me go now the other direction. So I, I ask you to make a statement in the language of a, an atomic formula in the language of set theory. So here we are the language of set theory, give me an atomic formula that says that y equals x intersection z. Okay, can I say so? No. No. Y is a member of x intersection z. That's something I can say. What? 
What, what, is, what is bothering you? Equal sign is a common symbol, so it's possible to do equal sign here. Yeah, I can do an equal sign. Uh, no, I could not. I could not have done y equals x intersection z. What? Because I don't have a symbol for intersection. I don't have in my language intersection, right? But we can express intersections using the theorem. But it's not going to be an atomic formula. Because it's going to use n for all. And it's not an atomic formula. But here I want an atomic formula. So can I say it or not? So how, can, how am I going to say this? With atomic formulas, yes. You can say R, uh, Y, X, or R, Y, Z. And. And, and, and. Right. I'll say R, Y, X, and R, Y, Z, which means y is a member of x, and y is a member of z. Yes? Is that considered atomic? What? Is that formula considered atomic? Oh, it's not atomic, you're right. It's, yeah. it's a connective. Oh, <laughs> very good. It's not an atomic formula. Oh, I cannot say much. I can say an atomic formula. I can only say x is in a member of y, right? Too bad. Right. So the only thing I can say in atomic formulas is very little. I can say y equals that, which is really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say uh, x is a member of y. Wait, you can say y equals it? Yeah, equal is, equal, oh, equal is one of my relations. Yeah, that's okay. a good point. I treat equal as one of my relation symbols. Right. So when I say here, it's I, R, when R is a carry relation symbol, uh, I include equality here. Yeah, that's a good comment. I view the equality as a relation symbol. Okay, so now we have our atomic formulas, and we already see that one step we made on top of terms is that now we can make statements that are either true or false. I can say, is it true or false that x is, equal to, is less than 2y? Is it true or false that y equals z? Or that x is a member of y? But I'm still limited. For example, this was forbidden. Because atomic formulas don't have these guys. So now we can see what's the next step. Now we can go to full step two and define our WAFs finally. So our set of WAFs, and this is language specific. So the set, the set of well-formed formulas in a given language L. And by, let me remind you what I mean by given language. So given the constants, functions, relations, is I of, here I have all the atomic formulas, that we got from generating terms and applying relations to the terms. And here I have my usual operations that I know from propositional, so my set P. My set P contains the usual operations that we know from propositional logic, all of those guys, plus all the for all and the is. So all the for all and there is, and I have to explain to you what are these operations. So for all, the for all as operation, the for all takes as input. It takes as input a formula phi and a variable x and outputs for all x phi. 
That's the operation for all. Maybe I should have called it O of for all and O of, maybe it's, it'll be more clear. O, the operation for for all and the operation for there exist, where the operation of for all takes a formula and a variable and says for all x the formula holds. And the operation for exists takes a formula phi and a variable, say y, it doesn't matter, and says there exists y such that phi. So now we have our set of operations. We have our notion of atomic formulas. And so actually, we, can, we should think of it as infinitely many operations. For every variable, I have an operation. For every variable x, I have the operation for all x. Yes? What? Uh, yeah, yeah. But so, so, yeah. Uh, I have here. Let's put it like this. I have here for all x, and there exist y, because they are not for, These are not atomic formulas. Right. So I have for all x, and and there exists y for every variable x and y. Uh, wondering what the definition of phi is. Phi is. I mean, now we have an inductive definition. So you start with atomic formulas and apply these operations. So I can get, you see, so I can get things like, I can, I can get things like, uh, I take an atomic formula. So an atomic formula could be x equals y. And now I have end to it another atomic formula, say uh, y equals uh, f of x y r z. So here I have an atomic formula, an atomic formula. I use the operation and. And now I can even go further and say for all x. And then I can keep going and say and and add variables. So it's the usual way of constructing a set by induction. We have operations. We start with, we, we already understood what are the atomic formulas. Now we have a way of using atomic formulas as building blocks to build more and more formulas. Whenever I have two formulas, I can connect them in any of the old ways. I can add a quantifier and keep building, because that's the nature of inductive definition. So all the formulas that we've, saw, that we've seen in the intuitive, non-formal uh, discussion that we had at the beginning, we can see how they are all formulas in this logic. OK? So now we have a logic, now things are well defined, we know what are the formulas. So you have a language, you have a language L, which comes with a set of symbols, and we, given lang a language L, we constructed the set of all WAFs of L by first constructing all the terms of L and then atomic formulas, and then combining atomic formulas in the usual ways that we already knew in propositional calculus, plus these two new rules, the for all and exists. But note that this also allows me, it allows me to, some of the formulas that I will build now may have no meaning. I mean, more, no intuitive meaning. I can say things like, right, so if I just follow the formal uh, definitions here, then uh, I may have formulas like for all x, a equals b. That's a legal formula. Because this is an atomic formula, and then I added for all x. And now we can ask things like the first games that we were playing in proposition logic. I can give you things and ask you, is this a formula or not? Now, 
I'm not going to repeat here the games with parentheses that we did before, you know, counting parentheses and showing that uh, how can we define, check what is the formula and what is not. It, it is all kind of repetitious to what we did in propositional logic. But the one thing that I do want to emphasize, which is a kind of a pitfall that people, that students tend to fall into, is that note that the dis very important to know the distinction between formulas and terms. So if I tell you something like 2x plus y squared, I cannot express it in a formula. It's not a formula. This is a term. So this is a term. But to say, and for all x, 2x plus y squared, what about this guy? It's nothing at all. This is, this is a term. This is not even something we could create. Because I can apply for all only to formulas. And this is not a formula. So this is just not appearing anywhere in my language. What I can have is say 2x plus y squared equals x. This is a formula because this is a term. This is a term. Now I applied a relation, the relation equal. This is an atomic formula. So this is a legal atomic formula. And I can say things like, for every x, 2x plus y squared equals x. That's a formula. So that's an atomic formula. That's a formula which is not atomic. This is nothing. This is a term. Yes? So our 2x plus y squared equals x is also a well for formula. What? So the 2x plus y squared equals x without the quantifier is still a well formed yeah. formula. Yeah. This is a well formed formula. This is an atomic formula. This plays the role of the p and q in the propositional logic. So we do not need to quantify it. Does that still have any meaning? Sure. It means it's that. Uh, what? It's, it's a stamp statement about x and y. I mean, what is a good point is that uh, I cannot, I don't have enough information to tell you if it's true or not. I will need more information to tell you. That's a very good point. Although it's a formula, I cannot tell you right based on just telling we're talking about real num we're talking about natural numbers. Is this true or not? I cannot tell you if it's true or not because I need more information. And we'll get to it soon. But it's a, it's a valid formula. Right. So this is then the next step that we will, we will get into. OK, so let me just maybe I'll write it. Oh, OK, this is a term. This is an atomic formula. And this is a formula which is not atomic. Right, but what you are asking about is about the semantics. Can I say for every formula, will the semantics tell me if it's true or not? And this is a formula that if I tell you my semantics is the natural numbers, you don't yet know if it's true or not. So this, uh, but we will discuss it in more detail when we get to the to the semantics, OK? What I want now to talk, I mean, it's very related. And this is a step that we will have to prepare for the semantics that we didn't have before. So the next syntactic notion that we are going to need is the notion of, so we, we know what our formulas are. We are still in the, completely in the syntax. The next syntactic important syntactic notion is a notion that we didn't have in something like that in the proposition logic. And that's the notion of a free variable.
So a free variable is intuitively, it's a variable that is not quantified. So here, x and y are both free, var free variables. Here, the x is not a free variable. It is quantified, but the y is a free variable. OK? So we define the free variables of a formula. And we say that we really care about, so we define by inductive induction on the construction of the set of WAFs what are the F of phi which are the set of free variables of phi. OK? And now, how, how do we define it, a set of free variables? So if we start with atomic formulas. So if phi atomic is atomic, then phi of f of phi is the set of all variables occurring in phi. So the free variables, let us look at some examples. So what are the free variables of f, b, b, g, x, f, b, y? Uh, this, is this a, what, what do I have here? Oh, I, I, f of. This is not. This is not yet. This is just a. What do I have here? I have two terms. I need to, OK, let's simplify it. Let's say they're equal to make it formal. I, I was thinking of extending it further, but that's, that's bad enough. So I have here two terms. This is t1. This is t2. They are connected by equality that makes it into an atomic formula. What are the free variables of this atomic formula? The free variables of this atomic formula are x and y. It's all the variables that occur in the atomic formula. Now we make the induction step. So what are the atomic formulas? Now I, I, I'm doing it by induction of the set of formulas. So what are the atomic formulas of phi 1 and phi 2? It's the same as the free variables of phi 1 or phi 2. It's the same or the set of free variables of phi 1 and of phi 2. And it is just f of phi 1 union f of phi 2. So the free variables in this, if I, if I use the, one of the propositional connectives, the free variables of the big formula are just all the variables that were either free on one of them or free in the other one. So this is still not, nothing is happening here. I'm just collecting all the variables and calling them all free. The interesting step is the for all. So the free variable and the free variables of not phi is the same as the free variables of phi. Nothing happened so far. I'm just collecting all the variables that I see around. 
The action is what happens when I have a for all and there exist. So the three variables of for all x phi are the three variables of phi minus x. So when I have a for all x phi, suddenly all the x's in phi are no longer free. They are captured by this for all. And similarly for their exist. It doesn't matter which variable. This holds for every variable. So the three variables of their exist z such as phi are going to be the three variables of y minus the variable z. Right, so x and z are just examples. Every quantifier that I have will kill the corresponding free variable from the free variables of the formula. So this is my definition of the set of free variables because it's defined following the inductive definition of the set of all formulas. Oh, I don't even have enough time to, for examples, sorry. Okay. So I will give you more examples next time on, on Tuesday. And uh, next week is kind of special, so we have midterm on Thursday. Thank you.